Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to invite you to listen to the proclamation of the Gospel according to Matthew for the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Jesus again spoke in reply to the chief priests and the elders of the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king grew enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads and invite to the feast anyone you come upon. So they went out into the streets and gathered all who they found, bad and good alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to greet the guests, he saw a man there dressed not in a wedding garment. He said to this man, Friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. The king said to his attendants, Bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. The scripture that we just heard from Matthew's Gospel is actually a single narrative that Matthew crafted out of three separate pieces of scripture. Two are parables, one is a saying. The first parable is the one about the master king wanting to fill the banquet hall with guests. The second is about the wedding garment and the man who did not wear the wedding garment. And the third is the saying, many are invited but few are chosen. And in each one of these separately, if we identify the king with God, it seems like we have a harsh God being described to us. However, I think closer inspection might mute that a little bit. And we might come to the conclusion that a summary of each of these uh, three elements individually and collectively might simply be saying God's kingdom come, God's will be done. So I'd like to address each one of these three sections individually and make a case for how they fit together. So the, the first is the part portion of the scripture that talks about the king wanting to have a wedding feast for his son. He prepares a marvelous banquet and out of a generous hope for his son, he invites his guests. And we know how that story unfolds. Uh, the interest in, but eventually the banquet hall is filled. But this is a story, again, of God's generous hope for us. And I think it is resonant of the story of creation, the second story of creation in the book of Genesis. Recall that God creates the world. God creates a human one out of the dust of the earth. And then he puts this human one into a wonderful garden. And in this garden, there are all kinds of plants and animals and everything that this human one could want. Uh, it is indeed a generous hope that this human one be happy and thrive in the kingdom that God has prepared for him. Uh, unfortunately, we know what happens, that uh, he is told not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he and his then human partner uh, do, in fact, eat of that fruit, and they are exiled from the garden. And that sets in train what we would today call the history of human salvation. God was generous in bestowing upon human beings in all creation a great hope for them in the, in the garden. Human beings squandered that. They thereby put themselves out of the garden, but God didn't abandon them. God kept inviting them over and over and over again into that garden 
which would be the kingdom of God. And over and over again, uh, the, those invited refused. Uh, and God's hope for salvation, for restoration of the original blessing, and for ultimate human happiness uh, were thwarted. And yet, God does not withdraw the invitation. God continues to invite. And so what we have here in this first parable is a passionate God saying, let my will be done, let my kingdom come, despite human resistance. The second parable is about the person who comes into the wedding banquet without a wedding garment. And uh, at first, it seems like the consequences of not wearing that wedding garment seem severe at the very least. And yet, if we look more carefully, we might see that it has to do with the very nature of the event into which this man was invited. A wedding feast presumes that people will come dressed in a wedding garment. And to not come dressed in the appropriate garment is to slight the person who makes the invitation, to slight his son. It's actually to do violence to the nature of the event itself. That which is intended to be a symbol of the kingdom is now violated by the failure to wear that garment. And so really what is happening here in the second parable is simply the consequences of this man essentially saying, uh, not your will be done, but mine. Or not your will, I don't pay attention to it. To drive home the point a little bit, we might compare the wedding garment back in the day of Jesus to masks in the time of a pandemic. And really to wear a mask is in a way to say, uh, I care for the people in my life, those around me, as well as for myself. It's a way of saying, May the right relationships that exist in God's kingdom come. Uh, a good example of this, perhaps in the uh, violation of the rule, would be the event that took place at the White House just a little over a week ago, where the announcement of the uh, new Supreme Court justice was made. And we saw pictures of uh, people not wearing masks, and eventually we know what happens, that what was intended to be uh, a, an announcement uh, a new Supreme Court justice potentially became, uh, a, in hindsight, uh, a super spreader event for the coronavirus. Um, and so what happened was the very nature of the event that was intended to be a great celebration for those who sponsored it uh, was violated by the failure to wear the wedding garment, that is, the mask in, in question. And so with the second parable, it's not just a question of a lack of decorum, it's a question of uh, not respecting the nature of that to which the persons were invited. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done, is in fact what unfolded. The third uh, part of this scripture, which is the saying, many are invited but few are chosen, uh, is indeed something that is um, a little puzzling, doesn't seem to jive with uh, the God that has a generous hope for us. And as I thought about this, I remembered uh, many, many years ago that uh, when I was a student at St. Ignatius High School, there was one day posted on the bulletin board an invitation to anybody in the student body who would like to try out for the St. Ignatius High School baseball team. There was a, a date and a time, and I was interested so I accepted the invitation, and the very first day, I'm guessing there were at least 80 young men who showed up to be on this team. And so these 80 young men came for a few days, and after the second or third day, uh, a list went up on the bulletin board that said, tomorrow, these are the people who ought to come to, who I want to invite to practice. And that list was smaller than the 80 people who had shown up a few days earlier. And after a few more days, still another list went up, and that list too of invitations was smaller still than the list previous, until that number 80 was whittled down to 
the number 25, which was the number for the team. It's very interesting to me as I reflected upon this that uh, the distinction between being invited and being chosen gets blurred in this story because at first there is a general invitation and then a few days later some are chosen to come again to be invited to another practice session and the cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. And I think that's how it is with the uh, kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We are invited over and over and over again throughout the course of our lifetime to behaviors and attitudes and ways of being that are reflective of the kingdom of heaven. And when we accept that invitation, the kingdom comes and we find ourselves among the chosen who dwell in that kingdom. But again, the invitation and the choice of God for us comes over and over and over again. Thought of some examples. Uh, and you've heard me say before that I often get requests for assistance from people. They'll stop me after Mass. And very often that request comes from people who have been here many times before. And as much as those requests might be sources of annoyance at first, what they really are are invitations to the Kingdom. And if I respond in a way that is appropriate to the requests, as according to God's will, then in effect what happens is I am chosen for participation more fully in that kingdom. Another example might be uh, one of a parent who is caring for children during this time of pandemic, especially parents who are caring for children who are at home, who have not yet returned to school. Every day, every day, they are invited to a way of being with their children and their larger family in a way that is reflective of the kind of relationships that should exist in the Kingdom of God. Love, nurturing, cultivating gifts in the family. And every day when that invitation comes and they accept it and they act in such a way with their children and wider family, in effect they are chosen for more participation in the Kingdom of God. How about the command that comes to us over and over again to love our neighbors as ourselves? or to even love our enemies. Every time we hear that command, every time we are invited to heed that command, and when we do it affirmatively, then in effect we are chosen for fuller participation in the Kingdom of Heaven. Or how about this one? Jesus tells his disciples when they ask, how often must I forgive? Seven times? And he says, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Wow. So every time we are invited to forgive and we accept that invitation by extending forgiveness, in effect we are chosen for participation more fully in the Kingdom of Heaven. Similarly, we can point to caring for our environment. You know, every time we uh, deliberately uh, recycle something, every time we reduce our carbon footprint, Every time we are invited to do this, to care for our common home, and we respond affirmatively, in effect, we are being drawn and chosen into the Kingdom more fully. Each of these repeated invitations and choices that blur into one another over and over again, when accepted affirmatively, are ways of saying, Your Kingdom come, Your will be done. So I think even though God might come across a little harsh in all three of these parables, there is this underlying sentiment or uh, conviction that happens over and over again. The bottom line is that we as human beings, we as Catholic Christians, are invited to say over and over and over again, despite the consequences, your kingdom come, your will be done. And we do so with the understanding that if we uh, do not accept the invitation, that in effect what we do is place ourselves outside the kingdom a little bit more or maybe diminish the emergence of that kingdom in our midst. And so I say that I think an appropriate prayer for us to end this particular scripture reflection is the prayer that we pray very, very often, always at liturgy and throughout the day. And so I enjoy, uh, invite you to pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.